Michael Cohen, I start with you. You were seen, and I, I you called in because you were just coming out. <laughs> you were wearing your turtleneck. You, you wanted a better picture, and we delivered. I know you probably are reluctant to share with us everything you shared with them, but I imagine you're one of the important witnesses as they present this case to the grand jury. Well, I did go to prison for Donald's dirty deed, and I did point the finger and state specifically that what I had done, meaning the NDA and the payment of the $130,000 to Stormy Daniels' attorney, Keith Davidson, was done at the direction of and for the benefit of Donald J. Trump, who I described as co-conspirator number one. And that's in your, I mean, that's in your sentencing memo. I mean, wh why is this happening now? Why didn't the feds ever charge him? Yeah, that's a great question, something that we should be asking the Southern District of New York. We should be asking Jeffrey Berman, who claimed that he had taken a sideline after recusing himself and then left it to Robert Kazami. But then again, each one of them ended up doing it for their own purpose, their own benefit, including Jeffrey Berman, who ended up writing a book about it. I mean, he does write a book about Maine DOJ getting really peeved about individual one. But, you know, Harry Lemon, I remember reading both the New York Times front page story, I think Peter Baker wrote it that day, um, and the actual sentencing memo. And there were more mentions of individual one than Michael Cohen. Why do you think now this case is being um, an attempt for accountability for individual one is taking place uh, from Alvin Bragg's office? I think it's all about Bragg. He came in, it was at the beginning, I think he was somewhat timid and he was roundly criticized, in fact, for bearing this case that he's now exhumed. He then brought criminal charges against the Trump organization. He won them, did a victory lap, and the New York Times was saying, you know, he's now uh, caught his stride. So I think that the case is probably not very different from the one that Pomerantz and Dunn quit yes. over. Pomerantz, by the way, to publish his own book about it all next week. <laughs> and Bragg has just decided that now's the time. And I think if Bragg has made that decision. This is not an exploratory grand jury. He's got to be going for the kill. Um, Harry Lippman, this may be a dumb question, and I understand that prosecutors are human beings as well, but it feels like as the Trump criminality shows no sign of ebbing and prosecutors show no sign of charging, I mean, we've now got, I think, Fonnie Willis as the most likely, right, to charge Trump with any crimes. I I'm struck by what you just said. Alvin Bragg was new. He lost his nerve. He, he had two of the most seasoned and experienced prosecutors on this case in Pomerantz and Dunn. And it took him two years to, to grow a backbone. Why, why don't they come into the jobs with backbones? That is a sort of psychological question. I think everything you say is true. And I see it as the flip side of if you shoot for the king, especially first, you better be prepared to kill. That means if you maim or worse, you know, get a mistrial or, God forbid, an acquittal, you're potentially ruined. And remember, a couple years ago, the former uh, president was riding more high. So I just think the the um, roll of the dice seemed more prohibitive then. And everyone is jockeying a little bit who is going to be first, and that is a somewhat, you know, guts and glory kind of inquiry. Suzanne, I hope I live long enough till we don't make this illusion of him as the king. Um, Suzanne Craig, <laughs> you were the person on this show the day that Michael was testifying who theorized, and you said this is just a theory, that this was bigger, that you did not think that with Alan Weisselberg at Rikers, they were they were sort of, you know, um, nipping at additional perhaps tax fraud violations solely or exclusively. You thought there was perhaps a broader Could look. Be. Yeah, you thought it was possible. Um, you were right. I try to keep track of people who are right, and you were one of them. <laughs> what do you make of, 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 of what, 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 um, the New York, what you are reporting today, what the Times is reporting? Well, and some, some excellent reporting by my colleagues today. I have to say, when, when I when I read it, the one thing you, you keep thinking, because they, they didn't bring it five years ago, and this is maddening, and I'm sort of veering into the camp all the time, that nothing is ever going to happen. I mean, they, they're going to bring a case, they pull it back, they're going to charge Trump, they just charged the Trump organization. But one of the things that I felt today when I read the story, potentially, is that there could be some movement somewhere with a witness, with evidence. They have had a lot of, and, and I, I'm not just talking Alan Weiselberg, I mean, they may have compiled other evidence in this that has, you know, given them 
additional confidence or just more confidence that that they can bring a case. And, and that's one thing I was just, you know, I was thinking just in terms of, do they have additional documents? Mm -hmm. Um, do they know more about that payment? You know, we, we didn't see the payment in, in his tax returns. We had visibility that we could have. There's no there's no direct line saying payment to Stormy Daniels or to the company that was involved. Was it buried in legal fees and they found something about that? There, mm. there just may be something in here that they now have more evidence and they're willing now to to move forward with it. We don't know, but it sort of feels that way if they, you know, there's other reasons maybe why they weren't willing to do it before, but that's one, you know, one thing that I'm just kind of thinking in the back of my mind. Um, because Suzanne is usually right, let's go with that theory. Um, you, I think, <laughs> testified, you met 14 times, right, with Alvin Bragg's office? 14. On this 14th or 15th visit a couple weeks ago, was there evidence that there were new witnesses or new documents? So. Like the last time I was on your show, I truly would love to spill the whole <laughs> meeting, the two and a half hour plus meeting, but I won't do that out of respect to the investigation. What I will tell you, and something that I talk about in my book, Revenge, is Donald will ultimately be held accountable for this Stormy Daniel payment. And I've always said, that this investigation that was to be brought by Alvin Bragg's office, previously Cy Vance Jr., is the most detrimental to him, his freedom, his livelihood, his business, etc., because it's the easiest to prove. The checks are the checks. We know a lot. There's recordings which have been released in the past. This is an easy one, unlike some of the other cases, like the Fannie Willis case in Georgia. Well, he will just come out and lie, which is what he does with impunity, and say, I truly thought that there was 17,861 votes stolen from me, so that yeah. attacks the credibility. In this specific case, the first three-month payment was made by Donald Trump, and I gave those to the House Oversight Committee who posted them, and so on. And so he's not in the same position where he can deny or lie the way that he will in some of the other matters. Can we go through what's in the public record? Because I don't think that jeopardizes what you may be asked to tell a grand jury. Have you been asked to testify for the grand jury? Uh, once again, I... I'm going to have to take the fifth on that. Understood, one with you. understood, <laughs> understood. Um, let, let me just let me deal then with what's in the public arena because you're right. You write about this in Revenge. You write about this in your first book. Some of this happened on TV. I mean, there's there's Trump walking to the back of Air Force One to talk to his own press corps after this spills into the open, and he says, "Talk to Michael Cohen." The checks come out. I think the New York Times puts them on the front page. Um, as Suzanne says, there's there's so much investigative journalism into this episode and into his finances. But then Rudy just spills the beans on Sean Hannity and says. <laughs> yeah, Michael did it. Because, so, because Rudy's an idiot. Right? Rudy broke. It's actually we'll, we'll Rudy. We'll call that who established broke, law, right? Well, I mean, Rudy's the one who broke the privilege. Explain that. Well, and, ex and explain Trump's criminal exposure here, the whole thing. Well, Rudy broke the privilege by discussing it, and therefore he put it out there into the into the universe. And so I'm certainly now allowed to discuss it. Uh, at the end of the day, his exposure is significant because as you know, stated by the others. Um, he now has his tax returns out there, and he did not declare this in the way that it should have been. And on top of that, you have the campaign finance violations, and you also have the misrepresentations and so on. And this, as I have always said, this case is the most significant case that will cause him the most immediate damage. I think that I remember asking Chris Christie about this case, and I think Mueller had already been appointed and was working on the special counsel investigation. And he shared your assessment that this case represented the gravest legal and political threat to Trump. Um, can, can you just walk me back in time and remind me what he did? He sleeps with Stormy Daniels, then what? Well, then I received a phone call. And the phone call was from David Pecker's group that she was going to. This is years after mm -hmm. we had already mm -hmm. 
spoken to for the very first time because there was an article that she wanted removed on the dirty.com. Uh, sorry for giving them the plug. But at the end of the day, um, least we can do years, la right. <laughs> years late. I mean, I only spent 13 months in Otisville with another three years of supervised release, a six year right sentence for Donald's dirty deeds. But then years later, as he was now going to be entering the final stage of the campaign, mm -hmm. he's already the Republican candidate. She returns, meaning Stormy Daniels. And I'm on I'm in communication with Keith Davidson, her attorney. We negotiate a settlement. This is all done with Donald, with Alan Weisselberg. What does Trump say? Can you can you I mean because you worked for him at the time, does he say, you know, she's a nice girl, keep her quiet, she'll take the money? And what does he say about the affair and about the hush money? But there were many conversations. It wasn't with that Trump there was with Trump, Trump about can this. Can you tell us about some of them? Yeah, I, again, I'd rather not because this is obviously going to be part of the testimony if, in fact, that they end up calling me and if, in fact, I end up down the road participating, you know, in this. There's a serious sacrifice, you know, to my life as well as to my family. I've already been through enough and watching the drip, drip, drip of the information come out, like Jeffrey Berman, who acknowledges in his own book that he was speaking to main justice, yeah. despite the fact that about he had recused case. himself <laughs> about this and other cases. Yet, I brought a bar complaint against him. The New York State Bar Association turned around and they dropped the investigation, claiming in his book he also says that he did nothing wrong. Well, there you go. Why well, have to do any homework?